okay. Um, I just wanted to just um just try and wrap up talking about the real numbers and I just wanted to say um Yeah, so let me try and wrap up by, by, um, so let me at least set out like what the plan would be to prove like everything we'd want to prove about the real numbers, you know basically to set out all the basic properties you assume when you do like um, calculus one. Well, of course you have like least upper bound property, but you also have like the same inequality stuff that you have for, you know, starting from the natural numbers. Like you also have to prove things like um, if A is less than B and X is greater than zero, then AX is less than BX you know, things like that. Um, and there's so many more, you know, I, it, I can't even write them all. I mean, I can, but it'll take a while for me to write them all down, you know? So um, I just wanted to um, kind of set out the plan to prove all these things, and but we won't follow through with the plan at all. We're just gonna, after this, we're just gonna move on to cardinality you know, but at least, you know, you can see that there, uh, there's just like some tedious stuff to do to check all these uh, properties hold. Okay, so what would be the plan? This is the strategy for checking or just making sure of all the reasonable real like real number arithmetic properties okay you know for example those like inequality stuff okay so what you do first is you define Um, the positive real numbers are plus just to be those real numbers subject to, well, you have to be greater than zero. Of course, you need to know what zero is. Zero. Well, that's the Dedekind cut corresponding to the rational number zero. Okay. So there's all those rational numbers Q. Oh, yeah. So, um, you take a sub zero to be all the rational numbers that are strictly less than zero and call b sub zero, all the rational numbers greater than or equal to zero. And then you define the real number zero just to be a sub zero, b sub zero. And then you take all the Dedekind cuts, which are greater than this, this Dedekind cut then you call that the positive real numbers. You define addition and I said some words about that before the break. Okay.
and if you are if you take your time with it it shouldn't be too hard to do that you define addition um and then you should show that when you add up two rational numbers addition in the rational numbers that's the same as taking the dedekind cuts corresponding to q and r adding those in the end you show that that corresponds with addition of the dedekind cuts corresponding to q and r all that nice stuff you would just find subtraction well you can even define like absolute value and stuff like that okay but um The next job would be to define uh, A times B for positive A and B. The reason you do it for positive A and B because you just want to def like well because you just want to avoid like you don't want to multiply two negative numbers and then get like something happen like you don't basically you don't want to accidentally define multiplication uh the wrong way okay that once you define a times b for positive real numbers you define it for all real numbers by you just say like um now, if A is less than zero, after that, if A is less than zero, you just define, um, and B is greater than zero, then you just define A times B as the negative of negative A times B, right? So that you multiply the two positive numbers, negative A and B, then take the negative of that. And so you do things like that, little tricks or something. Okay, then you can define multiplication And um, from there, you go on to prove whatever inequalities you need. Um, okay, so um, let me mention like one of the highlights that is i started writing it down before before i realized i didn't i had to wait to do it so okay let a and b be real numbers a is positive and there exists a natural number n such that and A is greater than B. Okay.
Okay, and let's prove this. I think this is sometimes called the Archimedean property for the real numbers. Okay. So let S just be all those natural numbers subject to Na is less than or equal to B. Okay. Um, wait, is that the right way to go? No, sorry. Yes, okay, this is the right way. This is, let's think about this set. Then S is non-empty since, oh, wait, uh, of course, okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. There's some like trivial cases to um, dispose of. That is when B is like negative. So if B is less than or equal to zero, then since A is positive, one times A is greater than B. So the N in the question would be the, the natural number one. Okay, so now we can assume B is greater than zero. And so if B is greater than zero, then zero times A is less than or equal to B. So um, zero is in S, so S is non-empty, okay? Now we have a non-empty subset of real numbers. And also um, for all N in S, we have N is less than or equal to B over A. So S is a non-empty subset of real numbers with a with an upper bound so s has the least upper bound by the least upper bound property of course this step it requires us to prove like that when i take the inequality n times a less than or equal to b i can multiply both sides by the positive number one over a and I still get a valid inequality. Okay, so um, I'm kind of like cheating a little bit there, just so you know. Okay, but anyways, we have a subset of the reals with an upper bound. The upper bound is B over A, so as a least upper bound, um, let's call it X. Okay. Um, and what do we do with this least upper bound? Okay. Um, X and R. Um, well, we, we can say that, uh, like for some small number, okay, so what can we say? We can say that there exists um, an element of S such that X minus one is less than N is less than X. Okay, why is that? Well, it's because X minus one is strictly less than the least upper bound. So it's not the least upper bound. 
okay? If there is no element of S bigger than X minus one, then that would be an upper bound for S. Okay, so let's explain, let's explain that why. If N were, were less than or equal to X minus one for all N, then X minus one would be an upper bound for S and it's not because X is the least upper bound. Okay, now it is hopefully coming together a little bit more because um, if since we have we can add one to everything in this inequality, then x is less than n plus one is less than x plus one. So n plus one is not in s because it's bigger than the least upper bound. Okay, and therefore n plus one times a has to be bigger than b. Okay, and that's the end. Okay, so that lets you do things like um, the corollary of that. You can say things like things that you always see in, in analysis. So corollary, let epsilon be greater than zero, then there exists a natural number n with one over n less than epsilon. Okay. So whatever small real number you come up with, I can always get a smaller um, number of the form one over n. Which can be useful, okay. So proof um, choose n such that n epsilon is greater than one, which you can do by the previous theorem. Okay. So that is where I want to stop for the real numbers. Um, of course, they're gonna stick around because we were talking about cardinality next. Okay. Okay, so um, cardinality, that is, we want to um, we have we might have two sets, and we want to compare their size. So our goal is to to have a well-defined, notion of the size of a set. Not only that, but it has to make sense with what we know. Like if I, um, also it should have like um, the size of a set with two elements should be two. And if I write down a set with three elements, it should have size cardinality three. So, um, so the cardinality of a set, I guess we should say it should be, it should match up.
with just like the way it should match up for finite sets. Um, it should match up somehow with the ideas of, I guess, counting, you know, like if I give you a set with five elements, you could just list them all out on your fingers, like, I could, if I gave you a set A, B, C, D, E, um, well, I have five fingers, so I tell you that there's five elements. Okay, so, so if we define like a, the size of a set or cardinality of a set, and then you tell me like, according to the definition, the cardinality of this unordered pair is like three, then we have a problem. It's kind of like this notion is bad, okay? Um, originally, I was gonna say it should match up with our intuition, but we'll see that uh, even when we define it nicely, it doesn't really match up with our intuition anyways. So that's not really a good requirement to have, okay? Um, so for finite sets, at least we kind of have a way we should, um, like one way we can think of it is like, how do I know, um, something has five elements? I can match each thing with one of my fingers or I can number the things like one, two, three, four, five, you know? So here's our, uh, our idea. Um, if we can match up the elements of a set X with natural numbers then we can count the elements of X. In other words, if we can write X equals X zero, X one, X two, oops, X three, then we have matched up the elements of X Well, we've matched it up with this set, zero, one, two, three. Now, if we remember the definition of our natural numbers, this is the definition of the natural number four. Okay. And this is the idea we use to count things. We say two sets have the same size if we can match them up. And our, the idea we use for match up, well, we don't say match up, we just use that there's a bijection. Okay, so that is our definition. Okay, so that is our definition. Let X and Y be two sets. Okay, we say X and Y have the same cardinality. And we write 
kind of like absolute value or modulus. And when do we write that? Well, we write that if there exists um, a bijective function f from x to y. Okay, and then we have the theorem. Uh, let x, y, and z be sets. Okay. The cardinality of x is equal to the cardinality of x, meaning there's a bijective function from x to x, the identity function. Okay. If x is the cardinality of x is equal to the cardinality of y, then cardinality of y is equal to the cardinality of x. And three, if the cardinality of x equals the cardinality of y, and the cardinality of y equals the cardinality of z, then cardinality of x equals the cardinality of z. Okay. In other words, like this notion of cardinality gives an equivalence relation, but um, there's a slight problem. It like gives an equivalence relation on all sets and if we think about all sets, that group, that thing is not a set itself. As we have seen, if it were a set, we would get a contradiction that is Russell's paradox. Okay. But let's just prove one of these so it's not too bad. Um, you know, suppose, the cardinality of X equals the cardinality of Y. Then there exists an one-to-one -one and onto F from X to Y. Well, then F inverse is also one and one and on two from Y to X. which proves that the cardinality of Y is equal to the cardinality of X, QED. And the other first and third properties are similar, just using properties of one being one-to-one -one and onto. Like for this, you need that the identity function is one-to-one -one and onto. For this third one, you need that the composition of two one-to-one -one and onto functions is also one-to-one -one and onto. And um, that is not too bad. Okay. Okay, so when things have cardinality equal, it means that we have a one-to-one -one and onto function. We'll let that mean uh, less than or equal to. Is we have a and that seems like a natural definition. If f from x to y is a one to one function, then we define or we write just like less than or equal to. Okay. Okay, and before we take a break, we can also define 
Okay. Um, if there exists a one-to-one -one and onto function f from x, what do I, oh, I want to say the other way. F from N, the natural number N to X. Then we write that the cardinality of X equals N. And we say X is finite and X has N elements. Then if X is not finite, we say it's infinite. Okay. And now um, we have these fancy definitions, but we want to um, we want to make sure that they agree with our like notion of less than and less than or equal to. Like um, if I know that I know that two is less than three as natural numbers. And what I want to know is that on the other side of it, I could have a set with cardinality two and a set with cardinality three. And I want to make sure we need to check that the cardinality of X is less than or equal to the cardinality of Y. Because we want, um, and not only that, like, two and three are sets, we want to make sure that, you know, anyways, we want to make sure that all the work we've done carries over to cardinality. Because it would be really bad if our notion of cardinality told us that um, three sheep is l less sheep than two sheep is. That would just be a disaster. Okay, so let's uh, now take, um, just another, uh, just like, let's br take a break until 4.30, if that's okay. And when we come back, we'll continue talking about cardinality. Okay.